Let's face it, social media is full of bad advice, whether it's what car you should buy, what stock you should pick, whether or not you should in crypto, or how you build your power apps and flows. There's lots of, let's call it, not the best information out there available. So today we're gonna to do something totally different. We're gonna capitalize on this and we're going to go and talk about all the bad things and why I think they're bad. And so where this came from is someone named JJ created a thread on LinkedIn about, hey, what's the worst power apps advice I could give? And a whole bunch of people replied. He tagged me, I threw in my two cents. And as I was looking at it, I was like, you know, like discussing some of this would just make for a good video. So let's switch over. We're going to roll through the comments and we're going to give you my two cents on them. I'm sure I'll upset some people along the way. Like I'm not blurring anything out. It's all on social media. So I'm just going to share it. And I'll also down in the description, I'll put a link to the actual thread if you want to jump in there and throw in your two cents as well. So here we go. JJ wants to know how to build a great power app. Wrong answers only. Go. So here were my ideas. Like I don't know why I'm on the top, but they are. So um, using Excel as a data source, that is a terrible idea. <laughs> Why? I had Excel is not a database. Excel is great for your business processes. I know you all love Excel, but it is a terrible, terrible, terrible Power Apps data source, right? It has problems with sharing, it has problems with security. It's not scalable. It doesn't delegate. Like there's all of these reasons you shouldn't. So there's a whole video up there I'll put a link to on why you shouldn't use Excel as a data source, but like it's just a literal no. Second, turn on all the experimental features. This is back to bad advice you get from social media all the time. I see other YouTubers, bloggers, things like that. They're like, hey, here's all these awesome experimental features. And they never say, by the way, let's not use those on production apps. So then you use them in production apps and then you end up hitting us up at Power Apps 911 and say, hey, can you fix my app for me? We, we help people, but just remember, experimental features are interesting. You should look at them, consider them, but more than likely you should not be using them in production. Build everything as a component. This was actually one of my consultants. After he learned about components, he said, hey, I'm going to build it all. So like he built a gallery, put it in a component and then pulled it over into three different screens, but all three of them needed to be different. And he's like, well, how do I make it configurable? And like he spent hours trying to make his component flexible enough to make it reusable on three screens. When in reality, three separate galleries was the correct answer for him, right? Copy, paste, edit. So components have their place. I really like components, especially for things that are truly reusable, headers, footers, navigation, that type of stuff. But if you're like, hey, I'm jumping through a lot of hoops to make this component work, you're probably doing it wrong. Number four, this one was a thing that happened to me in um, Orlando at a conference like five years ago. Somebody came up and was like, hey, you're the guy that makes ugly apps. Ha, 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 ha. I was like, I am. And he's like, let me show you how beautiful my app is. So he shows me this beautiful app. It's got all this fancy Chrome. Every screen is textured with fancy custom images for buttons. It was beautiful. So after he got done showing me, he's like, by the way, can I ask you a question? I'm like, of course. And so he says, hey, the app is really slow. Why is it slow? <laughs> I was like, well, you see all those fancy images and stuff that you've got in there? You've got like 100 megs of content that has to get downloaded, processed, and stored in memory every time your app runs because you've got all these giant image files in there. So actually making your app a little less pretty with a little less of the image flair would have made for better performance. So just be careful when you start adding all those fancy things. You can make very pretty apps. I do it on small pieces here and there, but you can overdo it and hurt your performance. So then we got some comments pushing back and I do want to point this one here. Like, um, so Samara said, Hey, like, is it really worse to have components than make it having a bunch of controls? And so like, this is kind of a, you know, gray area. She's, you're just going to see in a later comment from her. She's trying to use components to avoid the 500 control limit. I don't really think that it's working the way that she wants it to. Like, no, I, if you're trying, if you've got an app with hundreds and hundreds of controls, I don't think throwing 10 of those at a time into a component is really going to make it better. I've never like dug into it, but in my head, if you've got too much going on, you've just got too much going on, right? Watch out for your hot, hot pink, custom fonts. You'll see that kind of come in a few different times. And so then down here, <laughs> there you go. Someone asked me to actually make this video. This was kind of what got me thinking about it. And this morning it triggered, like I should definitely do it. So then we have Kevin Watts. Kevin's actually a friend of mine. We text way too much. Kevin kind of bothers me, but shh, don't tell him. But anyway, Kevin there, he's like, hey, hard coding everything. 
uh, navigation as complex as possible. So one of the things you don't want to do is make your app an adventure. Like a user shouldn't go in there and be like, hey, there's 27 things you can do. Guess which one you're supposed to do right now? That's not it. All right. In my classes, I really focus on let's build purpose-driven apps. You know, if you've got four different use cases and four different sets of people using the app, let's not have one app that accommodates all four. Let's set it up so there's four different apps one that is targeted for this group, one for this group, one for this group, one for this group. You're going to get better results. The app will be faster, more efficient, easier to maintain, and your users don't have to think so much. Trying to stop your users from thinking is always a good thing. Wide open security. Yes, a few different comments about security. Be very cognizant of your data. Like We're using Power Apps more and more for much more secure data, but make sure that whatever you're storing that on the back end is also secure, like a wide open SharePoint list Probably not a good idea. That Excel notebook, no, terrible workbook, whatever they're called, terrible idea. Dataverse, hmm, robust security model. Azure SQL, well, we can do a lot of lockdowns there as well. Um, random fonts and Comic Sans, well, you know, I don't know who does that, Kevin, maybe that's just a new thing, but uh, anyway, I love me some Kevin. So, oh, and of course, a Rick roll. I've never seen a Rick roll in an app, but knowing Kevin and his team of makers uh, at his company, like, it does not surprise me at all. All right, let's go down here a little bit further. Yeah, there's more of that data security stuff, uh, sharing the app because you don't know who should use the app. If you don't know who should be using the app, probably doing something wrong there, right? Um, and leave the organization, forget that every connection runs. Is that really bad advice? Like, do you care once you left? Like, you probably should if you're a hu good human, but James is probably more caring than I am. So high five, James. Oh, uh, let's kind of go down here a little bit further. Field labels are unnecessary. I love that, George. I've never thought about making a bunch of input fields and not putting labels to tell them what goes in there. Like, but I'm sure it happens. So, um, and hey, while we're reading all this, remember, like, I've built thousands of apps myself. Here at Power Apps 911, we've got thousands of customers all over the world. We do Power Apps products, anything from helping you for 30 minutes all the way to projects that have been running for years and years and years. We can help you with that. So if we can help you with that, just go over to www.powerapps901.com. Let us know how we can help you with your project. Yeah, Uday, uh, using Canvas apps for millions of records. I, I've seen some apps do a lot. So depending on your scenario, you can use it for millions of records, but you know, you're gonna have to be really smart about it. How about that? <laughs> do not filter the data and load all the data. Oh, that especially comes up for me for Power Automate Cloudflow. Like we don't wanna pull in all the data and then process it in the flow, let's push the filter upstream. Let's use those OData queries to say, hey, you know, instead of SharePoint, give me everything, just give me back this data or Dataverse, only give me back these fields and records and then I will work with that natively. So that is absolutely great advice. Filter early, filter often. Don't think about load time and performance. Oh, your users will probably help you think about that after the fact if you don't. Oh, uh, James, I love this one. I see this one about once a quarter from someone. Like They're like, hey, I got an app that refreshes every five seconds because I need most up-to-date data. Like, But the app acts really weird and doesn't behave. Yeah, because every five seconds, you're trying to re-render and reload the whole app. Don't do this. Like, even every 30 seconds, if you've really got to refresh, I'd prefer that you, you know, told the users to press a button, or if you're going to do it on some type of timer, do it like every few minutes. But every five seconds, 30 seconds, you are just asking for trouble. So Christian, start your projects on default environments without using solutions. So solutions for me are a mixed bag. I, I'm not a solution fan. I'll be the first one to admit it, right? But I feel like there's kind of this progression with solutions. So like you don't know about them, so you build everything in default. Then you learn about solutions, so you feel like everything should be in a solution. And then once you kind of get to a certain level of comfort with all of it, you realize that sometimes solutions are a good answer, sometimes solutions are not. And you kind of have to think through that. It's a more nuanced conversation. I don't want to get into the details today, but I want to be very careful about that guidance of like, always building solutions is the wrong guidance, never building solutions is the wrong guidance. There is a middle ground. And that's probably controversial. Like some of you are probably like, Shane's an idiot. Who, who thinks that? I think that. Who's built more apps than anyone you know? This guy right here. I feel okay with my opinion that, that it has a, a plus and a minus. The same thing when it comes to building a default environment. There are certain things that only work in the default environment. So don't tell me you can never put something in the default environment because 
you know, things like for a selected item in SharePoint, that flow only works in default environment. You want to use a trigger that is a Teams uh, message, only works in default environment. So, you know, nevers are always uh, get you in trouble. So Venu there, right, like loading all the data into collections. Yeah, so sometimes people find out about collections, kind of like solutions, and they're like, oh, everything always goes in collections. Remember, collections aren't delegable. So if you're saying, oh, I'll load in the collection because I can get back more than 2,000 items, you are incorrect. Unless you're doing that really bad idea of iterating through the collection to stack it up, I don't do that. But also just remember that collections do get loaded in memory. So you're carrying all that stuff around. Like, are you doing it unnecessarily? Would named formulas be a better way so then you let Power Apps figure it out? I don't know, like we're not trying to get into all those details, but that is great advice to think more about it. Like just don't haphazardly throw it all in collections. Another comment there about hard coding, running flows all the time, like, you know, and then expecting your app to keep up. No, thank you. We got solutions again, <laughs> just AI. So there's a few comments in here about this. You know, I'm a big fan of AI, like Copilot Studio. I think we should all be doing more with Copilot Studio. Hint, 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 hint. But I will tell you that yes, I use ChatGPT and Copilot, Gemini, whatever, to answer questions about formulas and scenarios and business projects and you know data designs all the time. But I don't just take it on its word, right? Like it's my assistant. It helps me think through what is the right answer. So using AI has its place, but it's not to just you know do your job for you. It's to help you think a little more. All right, Jared, those are all things we've kind of hit already there. There's more default environment, co-pilot, <laughs> bring in every data source you can, right? Like calm down, like let's not have too many data sources. Non-responsive design, that's another one. You know, we start with apps that are not responsive, then we end up with apps, all our apps should be responsive. In reality, there's a mix. And for the most part, I find that building responsive apps is not, you know, the what do you call it? The the juice is not worth the squeeze. Like a lot of times people build it responsive and spend all this time making it work. In reality, no one's going to use it anywhere other than a desktop. So why did we do that? Yes, you can, it's possible, but build intelligently. Like don't just make it responsive for the sake of it. Make sure you have business requirements. And if you are going to build responsive, make sure you're designing for specific form factors. You're just not generically being like, hey, here's all of um every device ever it works on like that that doesn't end well either oh dave don't ignore your delegation warnings yes like if you don't understand delegation it is irresponsible to build power apps go watch that video you should know everything there is to know about delegation before you ever build a power app use sharepoint as a database i don't know i i, I kind of might disagree with philippe there like we have a lot of apps that use sharepoint you just have to understand what sharepoint's good and not good at when it is the data source for your power app and then build and design um accordingly, right? Right, we kind of have hit the rest of those. <laughs> oh, my dear friend, Matthew, right? Never use error handling for patch statements because writing the database always works. Oh, error handling, yes, we need more of that in our apps. All right, more on scale, spending too much time building workarounds, good thought there. Oh, I like this one, just trying to avoid premium licensing. Right? Like the amount of tech debt that we see people create just because they don't want to go to a premium license, like. If you're gonna roll out an app that's got large scale data and lots of information, you need security and stuff, like it's really paying for a premium license the end of the world, you're gonna get your money's worth out of it. So let's build a better app using that instead of, you know, just being like, hey, I'm gonna, you know, build a Frankenstein app there to go around it. Oh, suggest use Microsoft Forms. Microsoft Forms has its place, I'm not gonna lie. So make sure you know at least about it because there are some times we use it as a front end to get stuff from people external as well. <laughs> Sprinkle in some Lotus Notes. Oh. Fun fact, I started on Lotus Notes in like 1996. I used to be a Lotus Notes guy. How crazy is that? Oh, Rob, I love this. Don't over-design, right? Like if, you know, what shade of blue you use should probably not be uh, a major driver in your app. And sometimes model-driven apps are just the way to go. Oh, here's a nice one. Use 300 fields on every table or every list. Oh, no, 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 right? Like, no. Be, be be smart about that for sure. You might have, need a different data model if you feel like you need 300 columns in your list or table. Creating too many variables like a variable aquarium. I like that one. Don't listen to clients in terms of their needs. You know best, right? Like, yeah, we run into that all the time. You know, here at Power Apps 91, we build lots of apps for lots of people. And so we're always having to, you know, bend our will. Like we want to do it one way, but if the customer wants to do it the other way, you should probably do it the way the customer wants. Microsoft Paint, I like that. 
Lots of posts in here about Comic Sans fonts. I didn't know you guys used so many different fonts. That's very interesting. Not planning for security going in. Okay, so there you go. I think I got through them all. I tried to skip the repetitors. Lots of, you know, the font stuff, lots of delegation, lots of cracks on Excel. More than its fair share of cracks on SharePoint. Didn't love that. But hopefully this gives you a great idea of, you know, what not to do. I think that sometimes is just as important as not. And if you are triggered by this stuff, anything in here makes you really angry, you're like, oh, I don't agree. Don't post out there. Let's have the conversation, right? Like social media is supposed to be social. Don't, don't flame anyone, but just do that. Or you can leave a comment in this video below. Also speaking in comments, let me know, like, did you like this? Was this something interesting? Or is this just a dumb idea that I should uh, put back in the box? All right, with that, I'm gonna say thanks and have a great day.